All right, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, coming to this debate. Um, well, you know, David has uh, mentioned a lot of arguments against Islam on his website, and uh, most of it I disagree with. I think it's a misrepresentation of what we believe. Um, but I was told to go first tonight, and so what I'm going to do, I'm actually make an affirmative case for why we believe in what, what we believe. But what we can do tonight is probably debate all of David Wood's issues and all of my issues all in one debate. It's just not going to happen. So I decided to talk about Surah 9, verse 29, and why this is one of the most, why seven reasons why this is the most magnificent verse in the Quran. Now, you know, David's on record as saying that Surah 9, verse 29 teaches violence against unbelievers. And um, I can understand how some Christians can get, or, you know, non-believers uh, can get offended by that. Uh, you know, after all, I mean, well, I think when we even enter the topic of jihad and Islam, people make certain presuppositions before even opening up the Quran. Uh, one of the most common presuppositions is the Christian Christianity is inherently a peaceful religion, which which preaches love and tolerance for all. So when you read a verse like this, according to David, which teaches to to fight against disbelievers. Well, Islam looks aggressive, Islam looks violent. And you know, I actually looked up that verse, and I'd like to read for it to you, and let me tell you what it really says here. Um, it says, and fight those who believe, fight those who believe not in Allah in the last day. <laughs> hold on a second, hold on a second. This must be some mistake here. I think this is just a typo, I think. Let, let, me, let me check it out. I actually have a Quran. Let me check it up on my Quran. This, this is obviously a typo. We're going to get down to the bottom of this. Hold on, let me see what it says over here. Uh, let me grab my little notes over here. This can't be. It said here, all right. David, it doesn't say that. It says, it says, fight those who, fight those who believe not in Allah in the last day. Hmm. Well, can we change the topic to what we all have in common? That's actually a much better topic, don't you think? I mean, actually, uh, because we do have a lot in common. Um, with the moderator, would that be okay? We could just change that topic? No, we're not Fight those who believe not in Allah the next day. Wait a second. We're forgetting something. That presupposition. That, that the presupposition about Christians being, you know, inherently peaceful, that preaches love and tolerance for all. That the, the, pre, the, pre, the presupposition is wrong. The truth of the matter is, during the 6th century, during the life of Muhammad, the Christians were one of the most violent, intolerant, and sadistic people ever to be recorded in world history. 6th century Christianity condemned religious freedom and subjected other co-religionists as well as other religions to blood-curdling torture. This is how they would bring people into the faith. And they were a clear and present danger that if not confronted would unleash a brutal campaign of genocide, torture, and barbarianism until all knees are bent to Christ. This verse, Surah 9 verse 29, came to meet this challenge and fought so that people can have the right to believe in the religion of their choice, a fundamental right which 6th century Christians denied. And of course, for those of you who don't know, Muhammad came in the 6th century. This era was known as the Dark Ages of Christianity. Now, I know a lot of Christians might say, well, the Bible doesn't teach that. Well, I would disagree with that, respectfully. And that's what we're going to debate tomorrow night, but we're not going to debate that tonight. That's just going to be way too much issues to debate. So let me go ahead and start establishing some evidence to back up my assertions tonight and my, and my arguments. Probably one of the greatest evidences for, for that is during the 6th century, during this era, the Christians declared that the entire Jewish race must be exterminated. And thus the Holocaust was commenced and nothing stood in the way of the complete extermination of the Jews except this one man, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and one verse, Surah 9 verse 29. But that's just not my opinion. Let me read to you what the Jewish virtual library has to say, what the Jewish historians have to say about this incident. 
It said, it looked like an end of Judaism in Judea. Why? Because the Christian declared that this race must be exterminated. However, things were going on in the Arabian desert, which within seven years would change the picture of the Near East and of the whole world. So what was going on in the Arabian desert? What was going on? That's Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that's Surah 9, verse 29. So, at this point, have I established enough evidence? Is that enough evidence to show that out there, you're a man sitting in Arabia, and somewhere out there you recognize there is a clear and present danger out there, looming out there, an advancing Christian army, bent on complete extermination of anyone who doesn't believe in what they believe. I think that is enough evidence. But there's a lot more. Let's go ahead and read from Augustana University. So really what I'm doing here, I'm just giving you the historical background of the Quran. And I think that's enough to, because this is a problem. I think people, they try to interpret the Quran according to their own whims, but they don't know the historical context. So let me continue. The historical context. We read over there from Augustana History Department. They talk about the era of Muhammad's time. They say, Christian leaders forced conversion of others with the application of torture during this time period, burning at the stake, drowning, and suffocation were common tortures. And that's how they used to bring people into Christianity. But the Jews were no better. We read inside Sarah Ibn Ishaq that the Jews surrounded uh, the Christians and gave them an ultimatum to convert to Judaism. And when they refused, they killed over 20,000 Christians. And then there were the never-ending uh, the never-ending uh, wars between the pagans and, uh, and the Christians. Uh, that was known as the uh, Persian-Roman Wars. For 600 years, they fought these wars with no end. But Surah 9, verse 29, chapter 9, verse 29, ended all of this. It ended 600 years of fighting between the pagans and the Romans and took these Jews and Christians and pagans and made them live under one nation as fellow neighbors. And so, that brings me to the next argument which you're going to find. I believe everybody has this sheet over here where I list all my arguments. Um, and let me, let's pause here and let's focus on this one argument. Is there a necessity for fighting against non-believers now that I've given you the historical context? Okay? Is there a necessity and a moral obligation to fight against the non-believers? I believe there is. I believe nobody can deny that. There is a necessity to fight against them. Let's move on to the next argument. And that Islam teaches the golden rule. And that golden rule, as we read inside chapter 4, verse 75, really needs no interpretation. And what is wrong with you that you fight not in the cause of Allah? For those are weak, ill-treated, oppressed among men, women, and children, whose cry is our Lord. Rescue us from this town whose people are oppressors. And raise, and raise, this, raise, from, uh, raise us from you one who will help us. You know, it's so ironic. You look in the Congo, you look, you know, even in today's time, you flip on the TV and you'll literally see people praying the prayer of chapter 4, verse 75 of the Quran. So the good Lord is saying, this is a reason why we fight. You know, I know some people say, no, 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 fight is to spread Islam. My advice for Mr. David Wood is don't bring up that argument tonight. Ah, this is some good advice. But anyway, if you want to bring that up, that's fine, that's fine. Now let's see how the companions, the companions of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam understood jihad. It says over here, uh, Omar says inside Sahih Muslim, so fighting, jihad, fighting, and this is talking about Surah 9, verse 29 again. Because Surah 9, verse 29 are the marching orders. Okay? It doesn't really tell you why you should go and fight against the, you know, against the, the non-believers. You'll get why you should fight it in chapter 4, verse 75, that verse which I just quoted for you. It says over here, uh, uh, Omar said, and fight on behalf to secure their safety. So this is also a part of warfare. And this is the reason what, why so many Christians allowed the Muslims to enter their lands. We read also in history, after the Battle of Yarmouk, that when the Muslims entered their lands, 
they began dancing and playing music. You know, because why? Because the Christians were so oppressive to them. You know? what, also, another thing which a lot of people don't understand is Christianity was very diverse. We had many different versions of Christianity. But it was the Roman Christians who believed in doctrinal unity and subjected the other group of Christians to blood-curdling torture. So Omer comes and says, we will fight to secure your safety. And also, you have a very volatile situation. You have Jews who are just the victims of genocide. You have the Christians. And you have the pagans, now all fellow citizens. So obviously there's going to be... That's, that's a very volatile mixture. There's going to be a lot of revenge attacks and stuff like that. Omar ibn Abdulaziz, one of the most prominent Salaf, says, War will be waged for any enemies of the disbelievers. So this is also another reason why Muslims fight. You know, it, 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 they're, they're, and this is something which also should be mentioned when we understand Surah 9, verse 29. You know, and I think the, the mistake David Wood has made and people like uh, Robert Spencer is they read verse 929 and they read it with this presupposition that the Jews and Christians were innocent. You know, we are, we are peace-loving people. Now, whether that's true today, I won't confirm or deny that, but that's not the historical context of the Quran. Whether you agree with it or not, that's not the way the Quran was altered. Okay, so, at this stage of the game, you know, I think I need to help out Mr. David Wood here. I can't leave him like this. Okay. I gotta take the stage here. I gotta take the stand over here. That initial shock was over. Oh, I'm glad I remembered the presupposition. That presupposition, you know, was, was wrong. Okay, now, you know, David, there is a hadith out there which says, and Prophet Muhammad said, and I have been ordered to fight against the people until they testify that there is no God but Allah, and if they do so, their property will be safe, and goes on like that. Don't bring me this hadith in tonight's debate. If you bring this hadith up tonight, you're going to be toast. All right, so I'll just some advice, okay? I remember I was actually, I think I was talking to Sam and Dave about this. I pointed out, hey, listen, you know, Surah 9, verse 29. This is, I think, was on AB and Sat. I said, you know, Surah 9, verse 29, this verse came and, and, and uh, saved the Jews from the genocide of what the Christians were doing to the Jews. That is a very good thing. It's very interesting what the response was. You know what the response was? Oh yeah, who's going to save them from the genocide of Muhammad? And I remember, <laughs> I was just sitting there and I just kind of froze. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, and, and because, because they didn't really refute my argument. Rather, what they're saying, what they're trying to show, is that Muhammad was a bad man. Muhammad was no better. Muhammad was not consistent. Okay, but let, even this, this false argument, let's just agree with it. That doesn't prove what I'm saying is wrong. That's, it's still a historical fact. You see? So, so, you know, I just want to point that out tonight, that trying to prove that Muhammad was a bad man, Muhammad was no better, Muhammad was not consistent, doesn't prove my argument to be false. David Wood's job tonight is to either agree or disagree with the seven arguments for that. And you know, there's also uh, a lot of people say, well, what about Muhammad? Didn't he say to kill the apostates? Which again, I disagree. You know, because one of the arguments there was, I said, look, Surah 9 verse 29 came to, um, to fight for the religious freedoms of people. A fundamental right which the Christians of the 6th century deny. So the Sahaba, you see Muhammad taught to kill the apostates, which actually isn't really true, but we can get into that, you know, if, there, if time persists, uh, we, we can get into that. But let's hypothetically go along with the canard. That doesn't, that doesn't prove my argument to be wrong. It still is true that the Christians were a threat to religious freedom. They subjected other religions to horrendous acts of torture and violence. Islam and Surah 9 verse 29 came to end this. And whether Muhammad made an exception, you know, a possible exception for the apostates, okay, but that doesn't make my argument to be false. Now, it doesn't mean those issues are not important. They're important. I'd love to debate that. I, but, you know, within the time frame of tonight's debate, let's, we'll see if we can tackle that issue. So, I actually have a challenge for my friend, Mr. David Boyd. 
if he can stay away from it, he can address the arguments on my, which I have just presented to him. You can find those same arguments on my website. Go to examinethetruth.com forward slash wood, and you can see those seven arguments. But if he can stay away from trying to debate, trying to refute my argument, saying Muhammad was a bad man, Muhammad was no better, Muhammad is not consistent. If he can stay away from that, I'm going to throw everybody a pizza party tomorrow night. Same place, same time. It's, this is going to be the pizza party challenge for Mr. David Wood. Let's move on to the last argument. And that is, God blessed the world through the violence which you read in Islam. By opening up the doors of science for the European world. But that's just not my opinion. That's actually what your school systems are teaching here in California. Uh, let me read to you what they say. It says over here, the Renaissance and the scientific revolution in Europe drew upon the discoveries of con and contributions made by Muslims to the field of mathematics and sciences. Yet these accomplish accomplishments remain unappreciated. And that's actually very true. People don't appreciate that. But let me back up here for a second. That's chapter 9, verse 29 they're talking about. It was the jihad which is what gave the Renaissance on the scientific revolution to Europe, which the historian, and this is actually what uh, California systems, I'm sorry, California school systems are teaching. That's Jihad, which did that. David Wood. Medievalhistory.net tells us, all Western advances in civil engineering, mathematics, chemistry, and medicine, and astronomy were founded upon the medieval sciences of Islam. Wait a second. That's Surah 9, verse 29, which did that. And here's how. By, by, it, Surah 9, verse 29 is what paved the path for all of this. And here's how. The verse encouraged Muslims to leave the Arabian Peninsula and fight against the non-believers and build a new society. This new society laid the foundation for all of the scientific advancement which the historians and the scholars are telling us that Islam gave us. It's jihad which gave us. Thus God bless the world through the violence which you see here. All right, so these are the seven arguments which we have of why, we, of why Surah 9 verse 29 is one of the most magnificent verses of the Quran. And um, I guess my time's up. And so um, I'll go ahead and ask Mr. David Wood to come. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Check, check, check. Good evening. I'd like to thank Orangewood Avenue Baptist Church for uh, hosting tonight's debate. Um, one of the great glories of Western civilization is that Christians, Jews, atheists, agnostics, Muslims, and others are free to gather at events like this where we can openly and honestly challenge and criticize opposing views without being threatened, assaulted, or killed for what we say. I'd also like to thank Nadir for stepping up to the microphone and showing future generations of Muslims that public debate is the way to move forward. You don't have to go around killing people in order to achieve good things. Over the past 14 centuries, more than 270 million people have been killed in the name of Islamic Jihad. Within our lifetimes, we've seen innocent victims slaughtered due to some outrage over books, films, cartoons, and of course, the burning of the Quran. Muslims have carried out nearly 18,000 terrorist attacks since 9-11, and everywhere we turn, we find organizations, both uh, Muslim and non-Muslim, working tirelessly to silence Islam's critics. The United Nations, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, CARE, the Islamic Society of North America, the Islamic Circle of North, North America, the Dearborn Police Department, and various media organizations and personalities have joined forces with the Taliban 
uh, revolution Muslim and murderers like Mohamed Bougueri, who assassinated Dutch filmmaker Theo van Gogh. These groups and individuals are using radically different means to achieve the same end. Care and ISNA silence critics by labeling them Islamophobic, hate-mongering bigots. The OIC and the United Nations seek to impose legal restrictions on free speech. The Taliban slaughters people at random when someone offends Muslims. The methods may vary, but the goal is always the same. Muhammad, the Quran, and Sharia must not be criticized. That's why it's refreshing to share the stage with a Muslim like Nadir, who's willing to defend his beliefs in public without uh, threats for violence. The topic before us is, does Islam promote violence towards non-Muslims? I confess I can't remember ever debating a topic as simple and straightforward as this one. Usually, debate topics leave us with some room for reasonable disagreement, but the Muslim sources are perfectly clear on this issue. Let's go back to Nadir's favorite verse, Surah 929 of the Quran, very simply says, fight those who believe not in Allah. Take a closer look at it here in a few moments. But think about it. Fight those who do not believe in Allah. What's our topic? Does Islam promote violence towards non-Muslims? What's the verse say? Fight, there's violence, those who do not believe, there's your non-Muslims. We find commands like this over and over again in the Quran, not just Surah 929. Surah 973 says, O Prophet, strive hard against the unbelievers and the hypocrites and be unyielding to them. Strive hard against whom? Evil dictators? Evil tyrants? People running around committing genocide? No, strive hard against the unbelievers. Let's look at another. Surah 9, verse 123. O oh, you who believe, fight those of the unbelievers who are near to you, and let them find in you hardness. Fight, or violence, those of the unbelievers, non-Muslims, who are near to you. In case you're wondering what these passages mean when they order Muslims to fight unbelievers, the Quran defines fighting for us in Surah 9, verse 111, which reads, Surely Allah has bought of the believers their persons and their property for this that they shall have the garden. They fight in Allah's way, so they slay and are slain. They fight in Allah's way, so they slay and are slain. Fighting in these verses involves slaying and getting slain. You keep killing until you get killed. It certainly sounds like violence to me. But are Muslims always supposed to be aggressive and violent when they're in power? No. Muslims are allowed to be merciful so long as this mercy is only directed towards fellow Muslims. Surah 48, 29 declares, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and those who are with him are severe against disbelievers and merciful among themselves. Muslims, by definition, according to the Quran, are severe against disbelievers, non-Muslims, and merciful among themselves. Whenever I point this out, someone says, uh-oh, David Wood just said that Muslims are supposed to be violent. Well, no, I didn't. The Quran did. So if you don't like what it says, you might want to take that up with Allah. Now, we all know from experience that in spite of what the Quran says, most Muslims have never hurt anyone and aren't trying to kill us. But how can Muslims be peaceful when the Quran clearly commands them to fight? Well, fortunately for those of us who don't want to be slaughtered, the vast majority of Muslims live far better lives than their religion tells them to live. Their Muslim friends have probably never read these verses that we're discussing, and even if they have, they've most likely reinterpreted them. So I don't want anyone to walk out of here tonight thinking that uh, since Islam orders Muslims to be violent, all Muslims are violent. I must point out, however, that genuinely peaceful Muslims are in complete, utter, total violation of Allah's commands. You see, Islam doesn't allow Muslims to reinterpret the clear commands of Allah. In fact, Islam blocks the reinterpretation of these violent passages in two ways. First, the Quran claims to be clear and perfect as is. Surah 6, verse 114. Shall I seek for a judge other than Allah when it is he who has sent down to you the book? 
fully explained? 11.1, one, this is a book whose verses have been made firm and free from imperfection and then have been expounded in detail. 12.1, these are verses of the clear book. 16.89, and we have sent down to thee the book explaining all things. 27.1, these are verses of the Quran, a book that makes things clear. 41.3, a book whereof the verses are explained in detail. 57.9, he it is who sends down clear communications upon his servant that he may bring you forth from utter darkness into light. Allah says that the Quran is clear, firm, free from imperfection, fully explained, expounded in detail. It explains all things. And yet, Allah's westernized followers tell us that when Allah says, fight those who do not believe, he actually means something totally different. Well, if Allah means something different from what he says, then the Quran isn't clear, it isn't free from imperfection, it isn't fully explained, it isn't expounded in detail. This is why a sincere Muslim should never dream of telling Allah what he really means in his perfectly clear book. Second, according to Islam, Muhammad is the greatest interpreter of the Quran. If you have Muhammad's interpretation of a verse, there's no further debate. And we happen to know exactly how Muhammad interpreted Surah 929. We have all the juicy details in Ibn Kathir's work, The Battles of the Prophet. Islam's greatest commentator writes, Allah, Most High, ordered the believers to prohibit the disbelievers from entering or coming near the sacred mosque. So the pagans were no longer allowed to take the pilgrimage to Mecca. <coughs> On that, Quraysh thought that this would reduce their profits from trade. So they would start losing money. Muhammad's tribe would start losing money. Therefore, Allah Most High compensated them and ordered them to fight the people of the book until they embrace Islam or pay the jizya. So if Christians and Jews become Muslims, they'll be, they'll be paying the, the zakat, and if they don't, they'll be paying the jizya. Either way, the Meccans make money. Allah says, here we have Surah uh, 9, 28 through 29, O ye who believe, truly the pagans are unclean. So let them not, after this year of theirs, approach the sacred mosque. And if you fear poverty, if you're worried about your money, soon will Allah enrich you, if he wills, out of his bounty, for Allah is all-knowing, all-wise. Fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden, which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Therefore, the Messenger of Allah decided to fight the Romans in order to call them to Islam. <coughs> Nadir told us a lovely little story about Allah's command to fight the unbelievers, why Allah did it, but what actually happened. The people of Muhammad's tribe were worried about how they were going to make money. In the past, they had made a ton of money from the polytheists, but now that Muhammad was in charge, the polytheists were no longer allowed to take the pilgrimage so the Quraysh wanted to know how they were going to pay their bills. Allah answered, you're going to make money by fighting the Christians and the Jews. They'll gladly pay you to avoid being killed. And Muhammad decided to fight the Romans. Surah 929, not according to me, not according to Nadir, according to Muslim sources, is a money-making scheme. Fight people until they pay you. The Jews and Christians are to be a source of revenue, source of income for Muslims. As for other non-Muslims, Muhammad interpreted Allah's command to fight unbelievers as a command to fight unbelievers. Muhammad said in Sahih Muslim number 33, Dear told me not to bring this up and that I will be crushed. That's an open invitation uh, in my book to be crushed. <laughs> Look forward to it. Sahih Muslim number 33, think about how clear this is. The Messenger of Allah said, I have been commanded to fight against people till they testify that there is no God but Allah, that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and they establish prayer and pay zakat, and if they do it, if they do all these things, if they become Muslims, if they do it, their blood and property are guaranteed protection on my behalf, except when justified by law, and their affairs rest with Allah. 
Because of the Quran's emphasis on fighting, Muhammad came to regard jihad, fighting in Allah's cause, as the greatest deed a Muslim can perform. The deer seem to agree. In Sahih al-Bukhari 2785, we read, A man came to Allah's messenger and said, Guide me to such a deed as equals jihad in reward. Muhammad replied, I do not find such a deed. The greatest thing you can do. Muhammad went so far as to declare that Muslims who don't fight the unbelievers, or at least want to fight the unbelievers, are hypocrites. We read in Sunan An-Nasai 3099, the Prophet said, Whoever dies without having fought or having thought of fighting, he dies on one of the branches of hypocrisy. Fighting is so essential to Islam that you cannot be a complete Muslim without fighting the unbeliever. In Sunan Ibn Majah 2763, Muhammad says, Whoever meets Allah with no mark on him as a result of fighting in his cause, he will meet him with a deficiency. In Islam, you are deficient if you do not have visible wounds on your body from fighting unbelievers. Muhammad, of course, didn't want to be a deficient Muslim, and so one of his greatest desires was to die while fighting non-Muslims. In Sahih al-Bukhari 2797, Muhammad says, By him in whose hands my soul is, I would love to be martyred in Allah's cause, and then come back to life, and then get martyred, and then come back to life again, and then get martyred, and then come back to life again, and then get martyred. Muslims of the world, you hear your prophet, I just want to go out and fight until I die, and then come back so I can fight and kill some more until I die, and then come back and fight some more and so I can kill and die, and then come back and then fight some more. Who wants to join my peaceful religion? Or else? Does Islam promote violence towards non-Muslims? The Quran says yes. Muhammad says yes. Westernized Muslims uh, either say no, or like Nadir, they qualify what it means to fight the unbelievers. Uh, but who speaks for Islam? The Quran, Muhammad, or Westernized Muslims like Nadir Ahmed? Nadir apparently thinks that uh, he understands the Quran better than Muhammad did. But if he really believes that, uh, he must believe that he can speak more clearly than Allah. Or that he at least interprets the Quran better than Muhammad did. Let's take a look at Nadir's argument. His position seems to be, the Christians of Muhammad's time were really, really bad. Allah commanded Muslims to fight these Christians because of their evil deeds. Muslims were justified in fighting the Christians because the Christians were bad. So. Christians are bad, Allah wanted Muslims to fight the Christians because they're bad, and they're justified because they were so bad. So Christians and Jews and pagans were fighting, and to stop the fighting, to stop all the fighting and bloodshed, according to Nadir, Allah sent the Muslims to fight all of them, so that everyone could ultimately live in harmony. And you can ask the, um, the Christian minorities in Pakistan, Iraq, and Egypt how that worked out for them. Let's look at Surah 929 of the Quran, since Nadir started off with that. Nadir says that this verse protected Jews from Christians. The problem is, Jews are, of course, included in the people that are to be fought. Let's read it. Let's see what Nadir claims about this and see if his claims uh, stand up to scrutiny. Fight those who believe not in Allah. Pay attention to every criterion for fighting people in this verse. Fight those who believe not in Allah nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Every criterion for fighting them there has to do with what they believe or their basic religious practices, the practices of their religion. Nothing in there about you're going out and you're committing genocide, you're going out and slaughtering people, nothing in there. But Nadir says that's why the verse was revealed. That was the problem with the Christians and Jews. Well, here he's contradicting his own Quran. Because if you want to know why Muslims were to fight the Christians and the Jews, go to the very next verse. All you have to do is keep reading. Context, my friends. The next verse tells Muslims why they are to fight us. Surah 9, verse 30. And the Jews say, Uzair is the son of Allah. And the Christians say, the Messiah is the son of Allah. These are the words of their mouths. They imitate the saying of those who disbelieve before. May Allah destroy them how they are turned away. 
What did the Christians do? Went around slaughtering people? No, Christians said Jesus is the Son of God. That's the crime. That's why you fight them. But Nadir apparently wants uh, something a little more um, something a little more peaceful for uh, Western viewers, but that's not what the Quran says. And let's look at another claim by Muhammad. Allah's Messenger said, I've been ordered to fight the people until they say, La ilaha illallah. I've been ordered to fight people until they become Muslims. Not, I've been ordered to fight people until they stop killing each other and stop all the bloodshed and stop all the mean acts. I've been ordered to fight them until they become Muslim. That's the goal. And finally, Islam's greatest commentator is Ibn Kathir. So Nadir apparently can speak more clearly than Allah. Um, he understands the Quran better than Muhammad did, but he also understands Islam better than Islam's greatest commentator, Ibn Kathir, who, in his commentary on Surah 2, 256, said, concluded, based on, his, based on his study of Islam, therefore all people of the world should be called to Islam. If any one of them refuses to do so, or refuses to pay the jizya, they should be fought till they are killed. This isn't about fighting a particular group who are killing each other. This is about fighting all people of the world. That is clear violence towards unbelievers. 